So hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, latest event that's being hosted by Speed Mooting. This is the Path to Becoming a Judge event in conjunction with the Judicial Appointments Commission. And um, we've got quite an action packed evening for you tonight, and we've got uh, three speakers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, very briefly announce who the speakers are. I won't go into too much detail in terms of introductions, because each of our speakers will deal with that in turn when they uh, come to speak to you. So speaking first tonight is Anuja Deer QC. Uh, Anuja sits in the Old Bailey as a judge and will be talking about her career. Um, after Anuja speaks, we'll then be hearing from Jane Furness, CBE, who is a late commissioner with the JAC. And then lastly, we'll be hearing from Claire Thurlow, who is the Senior Stakeholder Engagement and Diversity Manager, and she will be talking about the JAC website. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is John Dove. Some of you may know me. Um, I'm a Senior Crown Prosecutor with the Crown Prosecution Service, and I'm also the founder of Speed Mooting. So I hope that you all um, enjoy tonight's e uh, event. Um, at the end of the evening, there will be a Q&A session. Um, when we come to the Q&A session at the end, you can ask questions of any of our panelists. Um, throughout the evening, if you want, you can pop your questions into the chat box so that they can be answered later. Or if you're feeling particularly brave, you can jump on uh, and ask the question on the screen later on. So without further ado, we will get started. So I'll hand over firstly to Anuja Deer QC um, to give her talk. Hi, I'm Anuja. I'm a judge at the Old Bailey. It says Nikita Lavender under my picture. That's my daughter's name. So obviously my computer's being used um, when I'm not in the house. Um, my career at, at the bar started in 1989. Um, and I remained at the bar until 2012 when I was appointed as a judge, first at Woolwich Crown Court and then in 2017 at the Old Bailey. Can I just take you back to uh, what the world looked like when I was born? So I was born in the late 60s and in the late 60s it was still legal to discriminate against people on the grounds of their gender. And it was still legal to discriminate against people because of their race. And so at that time, when I was born, most people who held positions such as judges or politicians or people who were in a position to make really quite important decisions about people's lives, most of them were male and most of them were white. And many of them came from a certain type of background. Uh, and I hadn't ever thought growing up in Scotland uh, with two parents, neither of whom are lawyers, uh, that I would ever become a lawyer or ever really become a judge. I mean, that didn't even enter my head. But what my parents did do is that they always told us the importance of education. And my father, who came from India in the 50s, would say, I can't believe this country. Your education is free, free for everybody. And for him, the fact that we could all receive an education was, was just phenomenal. And so from a young age, it was driven into us that here is a privilege in education uh, that you would be silly to turn down. And well, as it so happened, I got the grades to get into university and I studied law, partly because I enjoyed debating and I couldn't think of what else to do. Um, and as luck would have it, I really enjoyed it. When I'd finished my degree, I decided to come to London and sit the bar exams. When I came to the bar, I knew nobody. Nobody from my university came. Um, and I didn't really know what the bar was, except for the fact that it was in London and it sounded a bit glamorous. Um, and in many ways, it was glamorous. It was a fantastic privilege, I thought, to be able to learn about people's lives and to be able to help them at a time when they were rather helpless and often very scared. And so although when I became a barrister and I qualified in 1989, the world really was a very different place to the world it is now. There were very few female judges, none in the senior judiciary at all, really, maybe one or two. Um, and judges were quite scary people. 
Um, and you would go to courtrooms where every single judge in that courtroom looked about the same. And even when I took Silk um, and then became a recorder, which was 2010, even by then, I remember sitting in courtrooms where every other judge around the table was male, was white, and came from a public school. In those days, when I started, and right until 2006, judges were appointed by, we, got, we used to call it a tap on the shoulder, but it wasn't quite that, but they were appointed by the senior judiciary in conjunction with the Lord Chancellor. And there was no process of knowing how it was that people became to be appointed. And so obviously, um, we all thought that judges were appointed if you just happened to have the right friends in the right places or had gone to the right school with the right people. And there's no doubt that sometimes that would have been the way it was done. Because it's human nature that we all gravitate to people who look like us and sound like us. Um, and then in 2006, it all changed with the Constitutional Reform Act. And from then on, and it was something that those of us who were involved in the Equality a Committee of the Bar Council, and diversity issues that were going on at the bar at that time, really pushed to get. And that was the independent selection of judges by a body called the Judicial Appointment Commission, who appoint judges on a simple criteria, and that is merit. Who are the most meritorious candidates for this job? And it has brought about a sea change in the face of the judiciary. So at the Old Bailey, which is a court in central London, and we try the most serious criminal cases, normally murder and terrorism, most of them involve at least one death, one dead body. Um, I am still the only non-white judge that there has been ever at the Old Bailey. But we are 50% women. And when I was a practitioner, I went to the Old Bailey, there was like one woman, one token woman uh, who was allowed in. And often in those days, uh, the women that were allowed in to the club um, had really struggled to get there and with huge sacrifices. And what that meant is few of them married and few of them had children. And as you can see from the name that appears um, under my picture, um, I do have children. And so that's another big change that's happened. Not only do we have more women, we have more diverse women, we have more parents in the judiciary. And what that means is not only are we more representative of society, but we bring our experiences, because we all do that, don't we, of life and what we've been through into our courtrooms. So what was my path? Well, my path was in many ways traditional and in some ways untraditional. Untraditional because of my background and because I went to a state school and I had absolutely no connections at all with the law or the bar. But traditional in the sense that I was a barrister. I was a barrister for 23 years before I became a judge and I was a Queen's Counsel as well. So in that sense, it was a traditional route to the bar. And now we encourage people from all different aspects of the profession to come into the bar. So at the Old Bailey, one of our judges was a solicitor, hadn't really set foot in a courtroom before she became a judge. And then there are people who come in uh, through the academic route as well. Brenda Hale, famous uh, president of the Supreme Court, first female to have that position, who'd come through the academic route rather than the traditional bar route. So it's not just gender and background, it's also where and what you've done before applying to become a judge. Now I know Jane, who's just hugely experienced commissioner, um, will be able to tell you all about the process of becoming a judge. But my tips would be, if you want to become a judge, you've got to go and see what a courtroom looks like. You don't actually have to appear in a courtroom, but go and see them. Go and see what the judges who are doing the job that you want to apply for do. Work out what you like and what you don't like about what they do and gather the evidence that will prove to the JC that you will make a very good judge. 
And the other thing that I would encourage you to do is speak to people who are in the profession. Um, and nowadays, there are quite a few ways in which you can do that. And if you can, try and get someone who will mentor you and just guide you on your way. Keep examples of the cases that you're involved in. And then after that, enjoy the profession that you are in. Um, when I went to Chambers, I knew that I was the odd one out. I just looked different and I sounded different. And I really wasn't prepared to pretend I was someone else. And, I, and the reason for that was it wasn't really arrogance. It might have been a bit of that. But it was also because I wouldn't really have been any good pretending I was somebody else. I'd be useless at it. So be yourself, but be good at every case that you do. And that way, it doesn't matter where you come from, you'll stand out and you will progress in the, your chosen arm of the law. But the reason I stayed was whatever the issues were at the time, um, wasn't the most um, in, it wasn't the most encouraging uh, sort of profession for someone from my background. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed every case that I did. Uh, I enjoyed the courtroom drama and atmosphere. I enjoyed getting myself stuck into a case and, and looking at it when I was defending, picking holes in it. And when I was prosecuting, uh, trying to make sure that there weren't any holes in it. And that, that gave me a real kick. And the reason that I applied to become a judge uh, was that I thought that being a judge was a huge privilege. And it is, I was right. The judge sets the tone for the courtroom. We decide how everybody in that courtroom is treated. How are the witnesses, the young, the vulnerable, the old, the not very intelligent, the scared, the traumatized witnesses in my courtroom, those who've lost a brother or a son, uh, those whose son is in sitting in the dock, uh, those who witnessed a fatal attack just as they were walking down the street or just having their lunch. Um, how do they feel? And what, do, what experience do they get when they're giving evidence in the courtroom? Do they, for the rest of their lives, say, I never want to go through that trauma again? Or do they say, actually, we've got a system of justice in our country that I, as a British citizen, am proud of? And so I set the tone in my courtroom, everyone, every judge does. And we decide and we dictate how everyone in that courtroom is treated and what experience they go away with. So it's a tremendous privilege to be a judge. And there isn't a day that goes by, even after, or is it nearly, nearly nine years now as a judge, that I don't think that. And it's also a responsibility. Because when I come home, I'm just Anuja, the mum, you know, when it's just, when is dinner going to be on the table? And have you done my arning? But when I'm a judge, I'm not an judge. I'm a representative of the judiciary. That's what I am. And my task is to make sure that the rule of law is upheld. Well, thank you very much for that talk. It was very interesting. And hopefully you've inspired some of our participants here tonight to uh, follow in your footsteps. Right. The next phase of the evening will be a talk from Jane. And there will be a PowerPoint presentation that. Um, that follows along with that. So um, what I'm going to do fairly quickly, um, Claire, would you mind going to the next slide? Um, we're going to, I'm going to be doing a bit of a Chris Whitty tonight because there wasn't a way for me to control the slides on an iPad. So Claire is going to do it for me. So you may periodically hear me saying next slide, please. But just um, for those who are interested, I'm a lay commissioner, which basically means um, I'm a non-lawyer, but I happen to have spent my whole professional life working in the justice system. So a lot of people wouldn't really regard me as lay in the um, in the general sense. But um, so my background um, is there on the screen for those of you who are interested. Um, and I've been a lay commissioner now for four years. And during that time, have overseen a number of um, uh, exercises, applications to the JAC and sat on the panel for the Court of Appeal a couple of times for the High Court 
um, president of the Queen's Bench Division and other senior roles. So I've got quite a lot of intelligence that I can share with you about what works for candidates and perhaps even more importantly, what doesn't. Could we go to the next slide, Claire, please? Thanks. So I'm not going to linger on this. Those of you who are particularly interested in the legislation that underpins the JAC can follow it up. But as Anuja said, we were established following the Constitutional Reform Act. And we've got three very clear um, statutory duties, which is to select candidates solely on merit. And I will say quite a bit about how we assess merit to select people of good character. And again, I'll briefly say something about that um, and to encourage diversity. But the, it's one of the things that does create difficulties um, for candidates is often that they say, um, you know, not enough minority ethnic candidates are being appointed um, and that there is a shortage. And indeed there is, although it is improving slowly. Um, but the the point is that we have to select on merit, so people have to demonstrate that they are sufficiently uh, meritorious to reach the level to be appointed. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we've got a strong commitment to fair selection and trying to ensure that all candidates of all backgrounds are assessed fairly. And there's a number of ways we do that. There is for every exercise a, an assigned commissioner who oversees how the process is being run. We run fair selection training for all the panels who make selections and all our interviews are observed by someone to make sure an independent external person to the process to make sure that the procedures and policies and uh, processes are followed fairly. All the selection material we use is designed for the particular exercise, is reviewed by staff internally, and we have an advisory group, which I won't go into this evening, but the membership of that is available on our website. And the advisory group reviews all the exercises we use. We have targeted outreach, so we particularly aim to talk to candidates um, who are in the groups that are less well represented in the judiciary. Um, and we can say a bit more about that. We monitor the progression of the target groups. Um, we're in increasingly using name blind shortlisting. Some of our shortlisting tools are online in any event, and therefore um, the characteristics names of the candidates won't be known to the system that's marking the electronic exercises, but where we're doing paper sifting of candidates, uh, names are um, removed and as far as possible characteristics are removed, i.e. gender, name, ethnicity, so that the panel doing the shortlisting are purely um, assessing on the information the candidate has provided. We can use, we are by law allowed to use equal merit provision. So this means that at various stages during the process, a candidate, um, if we're in a situation where we have more candidates than places, we can select candidates of equal merit um, and pre give preference to those who are in the groups which are less well represented. And at the moment that would mean uh, black minority ethnic candidates, women, uh, people with disabilities and solicitors, because those are the groups that are least well represented in the judiciary. Um, all the scoring of candidates is both moderated and calibrated, basically, and I won't go into the detail of that, but basically um, they're looked at very carefully to make sure that the evidence and the scoring match up so that we don't get any um, skewed um, effect on candidates and we use independent reviews of our systems regularly to make sure that we're using the most up-to-date um, ways of selecting professionally. Thanks Claire. Um, I'm often asked when I do these talks um, about 
what's the where's the best place to start if you're a candidate um, who is beginning to think about uh, judicial roles for the future. I mean, there are superb people who go from the bar or being a solicitor to um, senior judicial posts um, as a first role, but they are fairly rare. Most candidates will start at part-time fee-paid roles to gain judicial experience and then decide whether it's for them and whether they wish to progress. So um, they're usually uh, available about annually or every 18 months. And the roles that are the ones that would most commonly be regarded as entry level are the recorders, deputy district judges, fee page judges in the first tier trib tribunal and road user charging adjudicators. And though all those roles are available fairly regularly and are available to people without any judicial experience, um, they all have qualifications requirements. Um, and again, I'll come to that in a moment. Next slide. So generally vacancies are on a cycle. So annually, as you can see on this slide, there'll be a, an annual uh, selection exercise for high court judges, circuit judges, etc. I won't read what's on the slide. You can see that 18 months or so the tribunal judge vacancies come up and every couple of years district judge in the magistrates courts and the deputy district judge uh, roles are available. So all of those are ones that you can say to yourself um, if I'm not ready this time round it will be another 18 months, another year, another two years before I can apply again. And one of the really important things which people often don't do, rather to my surprise, is read the details of what's required of these of applications for these roles ahead of applying. So we will come in a little bit later on, Claire is going to introduce you all to the JAC website, which is a really important um, opportunity for you to get to know how it works and on there is very significant valuable information to you if you're thinking of applying at any point in the future. Next slide please. So just very briefly I'm going to talk about an overview of the selection process and then I'm going to talk uh, more about the, uh, the merit um, criteria in our competencies. So Unlike those days that Anuja talked about, um, all roles, all judicial roles are advertised and there will be a launch of every exercise on the JAC website. Um, candidates are all required to apply online um, and provide a self-assessment of, it's a written self-assessment in a format and to nominate independent, to uh, independent assessors provide further evidence. Um, for, in terms of eligibility, um, some of the roles have very strict uh, times, time of being a post-qualified post lawyer or at the bar. Um, and again, these are all set out on the website for each exercise. And some exercises have what are known as additional selection criteria, uh, which is specific to the role. We use a range of shortlisting methods, depending on the type of the role and the skills that are required and the numbers of candidates. So for example, we know that there are likely to be in excess of a thousand applicants for the recorder exercise. So there's an online test that we use and there may actually be two tests uh, used in order to reduce the numbers down so that it's a manage manageable number for selection day. And bears a relation to the number of posts that are available because the likelihood is we'll be selecting around 100 people to be a recorder um, from the thousand plus that apply. On selection day um, there usually is a role play for more uh, junior roles. Um, there is often a, um, a set of questions for the more senior roles for leadership roles, there is usually a presentation required, and then there will be follow that will be followed by um, an interview based on the competencies, which I'm going to come to in a moment. Um, for all our uh, 
uh, exercises, almost all our exercises, uh, we are required by the um, act and the regulations that followed to consult um, the most senior person, usually the person who, a person who has held the role that we're looking to fill so that they can comment from a detailed knowledge as to whether a candidate is likely to be suitable. Sometimes um, statutory con consultation is waived where it's an exercise where um, most of the applicants are unlikely to be known to the judiciary, particularly non-legal uh, roles in the tribunals. Uh, but most of the time there is statutory consultation. Um, character. I'll say briefly about this now, but I would, it would be one of my top tips to you all. Um, candidates are required to make a declaration that they are of good character and to um, declare anything that they think might have an impact on their application. So if you have a criminal offence from when you were 13 and you're now 35, you are still expected to declare it. If you have made a mess of your finances and not paid your tax or VAT on time some years ago, you're expected to declare it if you've been stopped for speeding, etc. And um, I use those examples because they're all things that we see quite frequently from candidates. The most important thing is you declare it, even if you can't remember all the details, um, because we will be asking for information from the police, from your professional body, from HMRC. Um, and if you don't declare and information is revealed, the situation is likely to be a lot more serious than if you'd revealed it in the first place. So top tip is be completely open um, and recognise that sometimes these things will impact on the ability to select you. Um, we have the JAC board meets as the selection and character committee once a fortnight and makes the decisions in relation to all the exercises. So the panel will recommend candidates. The commission then makes its recommendations to the appropriate authority, which is the Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief Justice, the president of the tribunal service, depending on the um, on the particular exercise. Thanks, Claire. Um, so we have what's known as the competency framework. Um, competencies are really just behaviours, a mix of behaviours, knowledge, experience, um, that together demonstrate that you can do one of these things. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about each one because I think this is one of the most useful things for potential candidates to really give thought to. There are six, but for most of you listening in this evening, I would guess the five are the most important because it's unlikely that you'll be going for leadership roles. You might, but I'm not going to talk about that very much. They are the five of exercising judgment, assimilating, clarifying information, managing work efficiently, working and communicating with others and possessing and building a knowledge and I'm just going to talk briefly about each one of those um, because I think it's really useful um, to give you some tips. The, one of the most important words that relates to the competencies is evidence, because what we expect candidates to do is provide us with evidence that they are able to do, to, to exercise judgment, etc. Um, not just assertion, or not just, um, I would be able to do this because it's got to be um, based on real evidence that you have done these things in particular contexts. So we would look for, in terms of exercising judgment, we'd look for examples that you're able to demonstrate um, your uh, independence of mind, ability to use information to reach a judgment, ability to apply the law, or if you haven't got direct evidence of that, certainly that you've been able to apply the rules and regulations of a body, for example. So you may have been the body, part of a professional body, a panel, a committee that's had to make some difficult decisions, and that's the sort of thing that we would expect you to be able to demonstrate your evidence um, from. Um, it's particularly useful if you can 
show that you have had to make a difficult decision, perhaps stand out against others who didn't think uh, what you were doing was the right thing, um, able to use your judgment in a highly charged emotional situation, a situation where not all the information and evidence is clear, and you've got to somehow come to the best judgment you can. So these are the sorts of things that um, it's a really good idea to think about uh, before you apply um, and um, particularly think how you did it, how you came to the judgment you came to. And in all these competencies, what's really helpful is to say, what was the problem? What did I do about it? What was the outcome? And particularly uh, think about you in that role. So that's exercising judgment. Shall we go to the next one? Um, so assimilating and clarifying information. Again, what we're looking for is people who've been perhaps faced with a plethora of information, some of it conflicting, um, where you needed to digest perhaps unfamiliar information, identify the key issues and really understand what the information was telling you. Um, so perhaps describe a situation where you were given, you had to face a large body of information at short notice. How did you assimilate it? How did you clarify what it all meant? Um, and what were the sorts of things that you thought about when the information was conflicting, giving you conflicting um, information? How did you resolve it? Um, if it was particularly complex, particularly technical, and as I say, something that you were having to grasp and, and um, grapple with for the first time or at short notice under pressure. That's a particularly good example to use because that is the daily life of a judge. So let's go to the next one. So managing work efficiently. I have to tell you, this is the one that often trips up lawyers more than any of the other competencies, because many of them will say in an interview when asked about this, well, I work very hard, I've got a heavy workload and, you know, my diary is always under pressure. Um, I mean, what we're trying to uh, understand here is times when you have been under workload pressure, because we assume that all of the candidates um, for judicial roles are under pressure in their roles. But how do you manage your workload? Um, how have you secured the cooperation of others to help you manage your workload? How did you make sure the work quality wasn't compromised? Um, have you used technology to help you do this? So it's really trying to think about practical ways that you can demonstrate that you have managed your work efficiently um, under pressure. Um, and if you've got an example where uh, something happened at short notice, unforeseen, um, where you had to uh, really raise, rise to the occasion of managing the demands, that's a good example to use um, to describe how you went about that. Uh, I'm using the word how a lot because I think that is one of the keys to success in making an application is to think not just what I did, but how I did it um, helps to describe your skills and therefore gives us evidence for your ability to uh, exercise um, the work of a judge. So let's go to possessing and building knowledge. Um, this might sound a bit similar to um, assimilating and clarifying, but this is really about how do you keep abreast of legal knowledge? What do you do, um, your, what often is described as continuous professional development? How do you keep abreast of knowledge? Do you read regularly? What do you read? I mean, some of you in this call may be academics who write the, the law in relation to certain aspects, um, write about the law. And those are people who are often able to give very good examples in possessing and building knowledge. How do you keep up to date? Um, and how do you uh, address gaps in your legal knowledge? Um, and um, particularly, how do you um, ensure that you're not out of date? Um, so any of the things that you do to, to improve your um, knowledge is particularly helpful in this 
uh, exercise and um, thinking about a, a specific example where you had to uh, learn about an unfamiliar area of law and then apply it in a particular case or situation would be a good example to use. And finally, working and communicating with others. Um, many of you will have had colleagues who are actually very good at the other four things, but are pretty hopeless at working cooperatively with you and colleagues. And it's a really important aspect of being a judge. I mean, Anuja was talking there at the end about setting the um, tone of the court. Um, you will know people who are incredibly clever, but are rude to uh, more junior colleagues. What we're looking for in this example is how the candidate does work with colleagues in a constructive way, how you can demonstrate that you can be uh, challenging, but always do it with courtesy, um, authority, being constructive. Um, examples where your own temper has been uh, challenged by circumstances and people, um, how you respond to people with special needs in the as clients in the court situation who don't speak the language, uh, perhaps have um, communication difficulties of one sort or another, and the steps you took to overcome that to make sure the person got a good service. Any of those sorts of examples are really helpful to uh, demonstrate what you would do faced with a litigant in person in the court situation who doesn't understand the procedures but is very keen to put their case um, and how you would handle that, um, how you would handle colleagues um, in the court situation who uh, perhaps aren't working as cooperatively with you as you would wish. So again, examples of um, situations in which you've had to work hard at working and communicating with others and what it was that you did that helped. So those are the competencies. I think the thing that I would emphasize um, really strongly is preparation. There is that old adage about fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And it is so true in examples of applying to be a judge. Too many candidates, in my experience, don't um, undertake the preparation ahead of the application. The fact that all of you are on this call suggests that you're people who are thinking ahead. Um, and I would really recommend that. If you're applying to be a judge at the moment and you haven't done your preparation, then it's too late because the amount of evidence you need, the work you need to do to get ready is very, very significant. It's not something you can sit down and do the night before the deadline. Um, so prepare thoroughly. It is all the exercises are very competitive. They may not always be competitive against a very large number of people, but they're competitive against a very high standard. Think about your particular strengths and what your aspirations are. Learn about the role. Um, if you can, sit in court, shadow a judge. Um, as Anuja said, seek help of colleagues who are more experienced than you, who will, are willing to share their experience with you, be a mentor to you either formally or informally. Um, re really use the JAC website, which we'll come to in a moment, um, because there is so much good uh, guidance on there that will help you. And start now collecting examples against those competencies of things that you have done, work you have done in a portfolio, so that when you sit down to write your application, when you sit down to prepare for the interview, you can say, for example, I did, for example, I did, um, and not rely on the same example over and over again, or do what happens to lots of us, which is your br mind goes blank and you can't think of the examples from two or three years ago. It is best to use examples that are relatively fresh, i.e. the last two years, um, because they will generally have more impact but that's not, if you've got a really good example from five years ago as well, then don't feel constrained about that. Um, and just finally, um, you do need to apply online. 
and there's usually a two week application period for most of the exercises. So you need to allow time um, to uh, complete the application and polish it. Um, we normally make uh, people aware that the process will start for an exercise at least a month before we advertise. So although there's a two week formal application process, there's often a six week notification process. So um, if you're not already signed up for the judging your future newsletter, which comes out notification of exercises coming up, you can sign up for those on our website. Um, and that's a really useful um, thing to do. Read the information page about the particular exercise on the website very carefully. Again, you might think that is, you know, that um, Sybil uh, faulty statement of the bleed and obvious, but I've read quite a few applications where people haven't, clearly have not read the information that was readily available. Um, read the application form and instructions very carefully and use specific clear examples of your evidence for the competencies, not assertions. So telling us that you believe in the rule of law is of course really important, but showing us that you are able to exercise your responsibility through an example is much more powerful when it comes to um, an application. I think, I'm about to stop and hand over to Claire, is that right? Oh, self-assessment top tips, um, thank you. So explain the part you played. Um, use the word I a lot, and this is quite counterintuitive for a lot of British people. We're much less good at this than um, Americans tend to be, and women are less good at it than men, in my experience. Women tend to talk we. Um, the team that they worked with or the organization that they were involved in. Um, men do it as well, but more men are better at saying I did. Um, and this is the time to use the I word. Provide evidence of your potential to rise to the particular challenges. So think about the role you're applying for and why the example you're using is relevant to it. Um, make the examples as relevant as you can and relate them to the required skills that are laid out in the job advert. Um, as I said, best practice is to use examples that are within two years, but that's not a rule. Um, think about the most powerful examples you've got, which may be older, but, but make sure you don't rely only on five year or 10 year old ones. Um, the, identifying the academic skills, that's because it's particularly relevant for those of you who are legal academics and think about how your skills as an academic might transfer to judicial office. Always get your application read by somebody. It says friend there. It needs to be a friend who is able to be rude to you, who will say, this is really quite muddled. This needs a good edit. Um, you've forgotten about X. So someone who knows you and knows your professional work, but is also able to tell you that this really isn't good enough and you could improve it in this, these sorts of ways. So a constructive critical friend, not your mum, I would suggest. Um, and quantify your success. So explain how you made a difference, what it was you did and what the impact outcome was um, as far as you possibly can. Those are the things that we look for when we're reading people's assessments of their work. And I think that is the point at which I hand over to Claire. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jane says, I'm, I'm Claire. I'm the um, Senior Stakeholder Engagement and Diversity Manager at the JEC. I'm just going to hop out of this presentation and onto the JEC website to give you a little bit of an overview of where to find the support that we have available. Don't worry about taking any notes. There is um, a handover that will accompany this presentation and embedded links into the actual presentation that we can share with you afterwards. So no need to do any scribbling, um, but hopefully being able to see the navigation will help you. So here is our homepage. 
imaginatively called traditionalappointments.gov.uk and this is where you'll come to for all of the information you'll need about JC selection exercises. So the very first port of call before you do anything is to have a look at our vacancies page which is right at the top for ease of access and that will give you a list of all of our current vacancies as well as the regular exercises that we run. So when we've been talking earlier um, this evening about the information page this is what we mean. This is where all the applications will be listed and you'll be able to click on each of them to find out exactly what you need to do to apply for that specific competition. It will tell you how many vacancies there are, where they're based and a very detailed timeline of when everything in the selection process is going to take place. So there's a real wealth of information there and as Jane said make sure you're checking that if you're thinking about applying during the application process and before the window closes to make sure that you really understand the needs of the role, what timeline is going to be required um, and the kind of different stages of, of application and shortlisting that you can expect. Um, if it's helpful to you, you can also see applications that are coming up in the future, um, as well as applications that have closed. So if you're thinking maybe you want to apply for something in a couple of years time, it's sometimes worth having a look at closed applications to see what was asked last time to give yourself a little bit of, of extra planning and preparation. Um, if we go back to the main homepage, also under the vacancy section is the judging your future tab as Jane touched on. So this is our newsletter that goes out to anyone who subscribes and will give you e-alerts about when a competition is going to be advertised, when it opens, when um, the closing period is. So I'd really recommend it's free to sign up. It's very easy. We don't spam you. Um, it's worth having a, a sign up for that so that you can select any roles that you might be interested in and then you'll be automatically sent all the latest information. It's a great way of making sure you don't miss anything. Um, the other good place to follow us for updates on um, uh, exercises that we're looking to run and, and reminders of when the closing dates are is on Twitter. You can follow us at Be A Judge on Twitter and that will also include a lot of the information but judging your future is a great one because you just don't have to think about it. It will automatically come to your inbox. <laughs> The other really useful information is largely contained in our becoming a judge section. So to start with, we recommend that people start with the Am I Eligible tab, which you can see under Becoming a Judge. And that will give you lots and lots of detailed information about what's involved in additional selection criteria, how long length of service for the roles are, what's actually the eligibility for a legal qualified role compared to a non-legal role. So make sure before you start, you're giving that a good thorough read to understand if actually you have everything you need to do in order to be able to apply. Crucially, am I ready to apply? Also gives you um, some information about the good character guidance that Jane touched on. So this link here will give you the full overview of the guidance that the um, SCC take into uh, that, that, that the SCC use to decide whether your declaration makes you a candidate of good character or not. So if you're unsure about any ca character issues, read that guidance and see what you need to be declaring. But as Jane highlighted. The most important thing is to declare it. If you have any doubts, put it down in your application. Be upfront at the start is the best advice we can give you. But have a good read of that as part of your application. Um, there's also some really useful information in the prepare before you apply tab. And that gives you, as well as a repeat of the vacancies, some guidance on how to start preparing your written evidence. So that will recap some of the examples that Jane gave you about thinking about the best possible examples to select, thinking about emphasising I rather than we, um, thinking about how um, who you want to ask to be your independent assessor. Um, as Jane mentioned, that for most of our roles, you'll need at least two. Um, and it's important that you select people who know you and your work really well. But there's guidance on our website that will tell you exactly the sorts of people you need to ask, what sort of evidence they'll have to provide. There's guidance for assessors and for you as an applicant. So have a good read um, and so that your independent assessors can vouch for you in the strongest possible terms um, and not be too surprised about having to, to sort of uh, account for you um, later, later down the line. Get them to read the information as well so they know exactly what's expected of them. Um, Claire, there's... Could just... Claire, can I just interrupt you there? Because, you certainly can. Um, one of the things that people sometimes think is that um, a high profile, well known, named um, independent assessor will be really useful to me. So um, I met Br Brenda Hale at a conference and I had a conversation with her. I'm sure she'd give me an independent assessment. 
um, or you know, the, I'm, I'm slightly caricaturing it, but we have had independent assessments written by people who actually barely knew the candidate, but who felt um, unable to say no um, to the candidate who asked and, ca and can say very little. So the independent assessment provides us with almost nothing. Um, so it, it, the name of the, the sort of um, esteem of the individual is not relevant. It's their knowledge of you and your work that really matters. Um, so that would be one of my tips. Make sure it's someone who really can talk about you with authority and knowledge. Thanks, Claire. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jane. It's such an important point to make sure that it, it's people that, that know you and can vouch for your work well. It doesn't matter who, who they are in the, in the hierarchy of the judiciary. We want them to know you. Um, also on this page, there's some useful sign-up material for if you want to prepare as a mock candidate. So many um, candidates, uh, would-be candidates, have a go at being mock candidates before they put a formal application in. And there's a facility on the website to allow you to do that. So you can take part in dry runs of selection material for exercises that you're uh, qualified to apply for. You're not obviously allowed to apply for that competition if you operate as a dry run candidate, but what it does do is give you a really good insight into the type of shortlisting that you might expect for that competition, the types of interview questions that you might come up against. So if you feel like you might want to apply in the future and you have the, re uh, the relevant qualifications to sit that um, test, then definitely take a look at this part of the website and see whether signing up to be a mock candidate might be helpful to you. There's also some information on here about our targeted outreach for underrepresented groups. So um, Jane mentioned this earlier, but we have um, a pilot program running, um, which is supported by the Ministry of Justice, which is provides tailored advice and JAC support to um, candidates from underrepresented groups who are interested in some of our most high profile um, exercises. You can self-refer to that scheme, um, but it's primarily aimed at um, candidates from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, women, disabled candidates and solicitor candidates, um, as they are the most underrepresented groups in the judiciary. Um, and the team will work with you to see where you can strengthen your application in the future, where you might need some additional mentoring um, and where you might be able to get some sort of uh, extra support from um, JAC commissioners. So it sits slightly outside of the JAC main work. But if you do fall into any of those groups and are interested in any of the exercises um, that the targeted outreach team supports recorder is one of them the others are, are our more senior posts have a little look at this part of the website and there's a link there to tell you exactly how to self-refer and find out a little bit more information about that um, the other good thing i'll quickly highlight is that um, we've also got some guidance on the actual application process this is a nice little infographic there to talk you through it. A little bit of an explanation about statutory consultation. But crucially, there's some really helpful case studies on the website. I know we've been really lucky to have Anuja talk about her experience of, of being a, a judge this evening. But there's also some case studies online that you can read um, as well that just give you a flavour of the sorts of different people and backgrounds that make up the judiciary. Um, and hopefully that will give you some encouragement that uh, it's not all the same sort of people that perhaps it used to be in the past. And um, we've got stories from all sorts of different people, all sorts of different backgrounds. And there's some really inspiring stories there. So make sure you check that out, um, as it also gives you a really good idea of what the reality of being a judge is like. Um, at apart from how the process works. So lots and lots of really good information online. And as I say, um, we'll be sending through the links to you so you don't need to worry about taking notes, but have a good dig around, see what you can find um, and make sure you can kind of digest and prepare as much as possible. One of the things we're sometimes asked is whether there's practice tests and practice papers. There aren't currently. We are looking to see whether we can develop some um, practice materials for the website in the future. But one thing you can find is um, feedback reports and evaluation reports from other exercises um, that will give you a little bit of background into um, how previous exercises ran, the sorts of themes that came up. So if you're interested, pop back into the guidance on the application process page and have a look at our feedback tab. And there you can read all the feedback reports from our recent exercises that will tell you how candidates performed and the sorts of things that they did. Again, the direct link to that will be in the handout. So um, I do really encourage you to have a good read because it will give you a really good overview of what to expect if you're coming into the process new. So that's the website. And I'll quickly just pop back to our final slide, which I think is just really to recap um, 
where else you can find out a little bit more. So as I say, those are the links that will be included. Um, as I say, follow us on Twitter and judging your future. You can sign up for alerts for specific com competitions that you're interested in through the website. Our targeted outreach team are always keen to hear from candidates who fit the criteria. So make sure you have a look at the self referral tab and have a good look at the case studies on the website and continue to come to events like tonight because I think as, as Jane and Anuja highlighted, this is a really great way to understand what's involved in judicial appointment, find out a bit more from the people who do it um, and hopefully come away with a little bit more encouragement that this might be something that suits you in the future and I think with that that's it from us we'll hand over for questions. Thank you both Jane and Claire that was very informative um, a lot of information to digest there so hopefully um, everybody found that nice and useful. So for the last half hour or so we're going to jump on to the Q&A session. The first question that we have is it's something that's been touched upon um, within the talk there, but maybe something that can be expanded upon by our panellists. Uh, and the question is, when is the right time for those in practice to think about becoming a judge? I can open that to any of our panellists. Shall I start with that? Please um, do. Because I think um, as early as possible is the answer, really. I mean, I think the fact that someone's asking the question probably means they're thinking that they might want to be a judge at some point. And... Um, if this evening's presentation has made that even more a possibility, then I think probably we've answered the question in the sense that it takes time to prepare, it takes time to gather your evidence and be able to demonstrate that you would be able to do the job. Yeah. Do the exercise on the website, the Am I Ready exercise. I've said this to colleagues, when I was applying to be a JAC commissioner, I did that exercise just to find out how it worked. I had to, of course, pretend that I'd got the legal qualifications, um, but then I took the exercise because it helped me really understand how the organisation worked. So top advice would be if you're at the very early stage, um, then go on the website, you do that exercise, that will help you um, identify whether you think you're ready um, and it will help you identify what you need to do. Uh, because the sooner the better. One of the reasons we wanted to run this session, as you will recall, John, is because I'm very keen that people um, think about a career as a judge when they're in the, while they're a bit law students. And there's no reason why you shouldn't have the ambition in 10 years' time or 15 years' time um, to do something that you're not yet anywhere near ready, but help, you know, it will help you to, to um, make some choices about what you do along the way. Absolutely. Great answer there. Um, Anuja, anything to add to that? Well, I agree. Certainly uh, several years before you actually want to be a judge. Uh, and that'll give you a chance to A, decide whether it's for you. When you become a full-time judge, it's a lifetime career. There's no going back to the bar for me, for example. And luckily, I don't want to, but what a terrible shame if I did. Uh, but also, just to get yourself in the right uh, mindset to apply and to give up a career that you will probably have really enjoyed doing to do something different. And it is very different. When I was at the bar, I was master of my own diary. And um, I couldn't say anything I wanted to say, but I could pretty much say what I wanted. And I could um, be quite revolutionary about things that I didn't approve of and didn't like and force through change. Well, as a judge, I don't have as much freedom to do that because I represent, as I said, the judiciary. When I go into court, I'm not me. I'm a judge. Um, and so you are constrained in what you can say and do. You can bring about change, but you have to do it in a very different way. And there's a hierarchy in the judiciary that didn't really apply in the same way at the independent bar. So have a think about it early. Think about whether your temperament is suited to it. Um, and if it is, as, as Jane has said now, uh, make sure you prepare well and prepare in advance. Thank you both. Moral of the story, prepare as early as possible. Right, I've, I've seen a few questions go into the chat box, which I'll turn to in just a moment. Um, I think Stephen's hand went up first, though. Um, Stephen, if you want to ask your question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Thank you. Thank you all for a very interesting talk. Um, a question, if, if somebody's worked for some time as a, an advocate, but hasn't um, 
secured pupillage, um, so has, has many years experience in court, but hasn't gained that particular qualification. Uh, would that suffice um, to fulfil the, the criteria uh, for perhaps of one of the, the, the um, more junior roles in the judiciary? Jane, it's probably a question for Claire or, or Jane. Yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. You don't have to have um, been a pupil to uh, become a judge. Um, that's basically the point. So um, what, you've got to be able to, what you've got to do is get your qualification as a solicitor or a member of the bar um, and have had sufficient post qualification experience. Each, each exercise sets out what that criteria is, how many years that is, for example. Um, but pupillage itself isn't a, isn't a bar to being, um, it doesn't prevent you being a judge. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and my advice would be, um, if in doubt, phone the JC and ask them, because the criteria for each exercise will be different, and a lot will depend, Stephen, on uh, what it is that you want to apply for. Yeah. Uh, so before you start filling out the form, phone the JC and ask them. Thank you. There'll always be a, a named uh, mailbox for any exercise that you're interested in where you can directly contact the team dealing with it. So if in doubt, drop them a note. They're all very helpful, nice people. Um, so no question is a silly one. Do, do take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Right, the next question that we have, um, I guess this will be um, mainly for Anuja actually. Um, it says, in your professional experience, is becoming a judge something that is desired from a young age, or is it a role that's grown into after years of experience in the in the legal profession? Both. Depends, <laughs> on who you are. Depends who you are. I mean, I don't think I'd have, uh, in my 20s, have been a natural candidate for being a judge at all. I was much more of a fighter uh, than, a, than a judge. And, you know, it's not, you're not much use as a judge if you're a fighter, really. Uh, you can be a questioner, you can inquire, uh, but uh, your role is a bit, a bit like a referee um, and to make sure everybody else is behaving. So you can't go taking on battles yourself that you don't need to. So it, it, it just depends on the individual, but you'll know. Um, and as Jane has said, uh, go and sit with judges, get some experience, have a think about it. Think about whether it's for you. And one of the things it has meant for me is that I've been able to spend more time with my children. Um, and that's been an added, and really has been an added bonus because I've got three of them. So it's meant a different pace of uh, life, more consistent rather than the highs and lows of a profession as a silk at the bar. I do, I do think it's worth um, those of you who do spend time in court um, or ca can do is listing for yourself the what the qualities are that you've observed that make a good judge and what are the qualities that you observe that you think I wouldn't if I was a judge I wouldn't want to be like that mm -hmm. um, and think about um, you know do you see yourself in the first category or the second category because it's really important Anuja's point because once you're appointed as a salaried judge you can't go back um, eat certainly at all or um, certainly not easily um, and um, you know it's a really um, clearly if you become a fee paid judge you can decide it isn't for you and stop taking work that's an easier one so certainly getting some experience as a fee paid judge is a very good way of testing uh, whether it's the right career for you and um, I I'm considerably older than Anuja so started work when it was still unlawful uh, it was still lawful to discriminate um on the grounds of sex um, and race um and i started work as a probation officer when his honor judge james pickles was a the presiding judge in my local court now his name may not mean anything to many of you because you'll be too young but he regularly made me sit there thinking well i wouldn't want to be a judge like that because he was so rude and unpleasant to most of the people in his courtroom both the the, um, the professionals and the victims and witnesses that came before him and he used to eat his probation officer for breakfast most mornings um, but it's really so I, I tell you that story because it was very it had a very profound impact on me as a 21 year old thinking about how professional people behave to each other 
and whether it was the right use of power to do what he did. Thank you. So we have the most loyally answer there. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, the next question we have is from Dale. Um, he says he's 41 and he's just starting his law degree. Um, when he qualifies, he looks to pursue a career at the bar. So his question is, is it realistic that a mature student could reach a role in the judiciary, given the time and experience required um, to get to that stage? Yes. There you go. Yeah. Simple, <laughs> simple answer to that. If you're 41 and you have um, a lot of a lot of the exercises, seven years post qualification experience, some, some are slightly more again, have a look at the criteria. Uh, but I think we're about to get the retirement age lifted to 75, if not 75, then 72, certainly. Uh, so plenty of time. Yeah, plenty Great. of time. Right, uh, next question that we have. Um, what is the best way to find a suitable mentor at the judiciary, um, particularly for somebody who doesn't have contacts? Um, it said that the JAC website for mentor schemes appears closed at present. And with court closures due to COVID, working from home, it's very difficult to get exposure to court. Um, so how is it possible for somebody who doesn't have that present day-to-day -day court experience to uh, find a mentor in the judiciary? There are lots and lots of different bodies that provide mentors. Um, and I would uh, try them all and then find a mentor that suits you. But, th but there are many ways to do it, not just the JAC through the JAC, but the Judicial Office will have mentors as well. Um, and there are various other organisations uh, as well that provide mentors. I think, um, depending on whether, I don't know the person who's asking the question, whether you're someone who is a barrister or a solicitor, um, because the inns mostly have um, mentoring schemes or access to it, Ad seeking advice through your inn would be the top advice um, from me um, if you're a barrister. If you're a solicitor, um, it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. You know, senior people in your firm will probably know, will have connections that um, can be used. Most, I mean, one of the things that people often forget is that most senior people are really delighted to help. Um, so it, it, you only have to ask, um, and most senior people, in my experience, in all sorts of work, walks of life, really like being asked by someone who wants to get on. Um, could you help me? Could you give me advice? Could you give me some time? Um, my advice would be be very cautious about paying somebody um, for mentoring, because quite often they're people who are charging when actually they're not really going to be that valuable to you. I, I would not, I wouldn't say never pay, which some of my, some colleagues would say in the, in the legal profession, but be cautious, I would say, um, because in my experience, we've seen candidates who it's clear have had paid professional help with their um, statement of suitability and preparation for the interview and it's not necessarily been a good investment of money and time. On the other hand make sure someone does as Jane said earlier does look over your application form um, and, and I wouldn't suggest to anyone that they apply for a judicial post without getting a critical friend to look over it. Yeah. The, the other back. thing to just quickly add if that's okay John um, is that this possibly for people a little bit further further down the line a couple of years in but there is something called the pre-application education program um, which is run by the judiciary um, but with support from the JAC and the professional bodies and that's intended to be a kind of introduction to judge craft for people who are from largely underrepresented groups and might like to learn more about what a career as a judge involves. Um, the programme is advertised on the judiciary website. Um, it's called PAGE for short, but stands for Pre-Application Education Programme. Um, I think I've got that the right way around. 
um, and it will give you there's also some free YouTube videos on there so if you want a good quick free start to have a bit of an idea about some of the skills of Judgecraft anybody can watch those there's 10 in the series and it will give you a good introduction to some individuals and the sorts of things you might want to think about going forward as, as well as kind of how to apply for the program in the future so do have a little look at that as well as as Anuja and Jane have said contact your professional bodies um, contact the judicial office and see what kind of other other support is out there for you some great pointers there for everyone right uh, the next question we have um in addition to shadowing a judge what are some good work experiences or experience opportunities for current law students so in addition to shadowing a judge any other type of experience i mean endless opportunities there john um you can get a mini pupillage uh, in a set of chambers, you can do work experience in a solicitor's firm. Uh, when I was a law student, um, I worked in an advice centre, uh, giving advice, I hope I was right, actually, uh, free of charge to people who came in through the door. I mean, there are just endless numbers of places that you can help at. There are lots of, uh, whether it's in an immigration centre, uh, whether it's a, a place for uh, women who are not treated well or children, uh, it, it is whatever takes your fancy. And I, what I will say to everybody is you, know, you spend an awfully long time at work, especially if you're in the legal profession. Do something that you enjoy, uh, whatever area that is. And they're hugely different. Employment lawyers will have a very different life to me as a, a generally a criminal practitioner. Commercial law, again, extremely different. Choose an area that you are passionate about because you're going to spend many hours and years doing it. And once you've done that, you will find endless opportunities to volunteer or assist or get further experience. People are in institutions and organisations, they're crying out for volunteers. Mm. Yeah, a lot of charities um, need bright, uh, not yet legally qualified, but people who've got a legal mind um, to help. Um, the other thing is there's a whole area of work in the tribunal service which doesn't require legal, legally qualified people. So those uh, non-legal roles that we advertise um, are always worth looking at to see if you've got any particular expertise or um, approach. I mean, some of them are expert, medical, medically qualified, or um, people are you know qualified in housing and planning and so on. But there are others which are non. Um, expert, non-specific expert, but um, require people a fair-minded approach. Being a school governor is a really useful experience um, for uh, managing, for applying, because as a school governor you often have to manage um, uh, challenges from parents, from teachers, etc. So there are a number of roles, trustee roles, are very helpful to people to think about um, providing ex uh, evidence of their expertise and ability to meet the competencies. It might sound silly, but if you belong to a sports club, you know, a cricket club or um, um, some other kind of sporting activity, again, they have often require people to make judgments about regulatory uh, breaches and so on. So there's a, a wide range and we do see candidates who use that kind of experience really well to match against their legal experience. Thank you. Right. The next question we have uh, specifically for Anuja. Um, what is the most rewarding experience from being a judge? Not um, any question. Uh, sorry, I was just thinking about what the most rewarding is. There are many rewarding uh, aspects to my job, but I think uh, the most rewarding one is... Um, that because I do come from an unusual background, uh, I've known lots of people as I grew up that were from marginalised communities or uh, from communities that, where, where the women in particular just wouldn't feel confident about coming to court and giving evidence because it's just not what you did. Um, and I think um, one of the most rewarding factors for me has been to be able to bring that experience to my courtroom. And so I'm acutely aware of, well, I hope I am, of everybody in my courtroom and how they feel. That doesn't mean I'm a touchy-feely judge. I can be quite hard when I need to be. But it does mean 
that I make sure, or I hope I do, that people have a voice and that people are able to tell their stories in an environment um, and surroundings in which they feel relatively comfortable because it is a formal process giving evidence or being a defendant or even being a juror in court. So I hope that that is what I am able to bring to bear in my courtroom. And I also hope that then the people in front of me, because you know, um, we all learn from each other, don't we? As Jane said, um, she learned from a judge fairly early on as a probation officer about what she liked and what she didn't like. Um, and, and that is the nature of the game. And I hope that when people come into my courtroom, uh, they go away uh, with a sense that um, everybody can be heard and hopefully that they take that on. And in their cases at the bar or when they choose to become judges, they adopt the same sort of approach. Um, and and, I, and I'd, I'd be very happy in myself if that is what I've achieved, uh, but that is what I, would say has been the most rewarding. Thank you. Very inspirational little talk there. <laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully that's answered the question. Um, right, we've got uh, one more question in the chat, which is um, for, for all of the panelists. Uh, would you say a wide variety of knowledge or a depth of knowledge in a specific field would be the best foundation for becoming a judge? Mm. Well, I think that's another one where it depends is the answer because it will um, depend on the role that you're applying for. So um, quite a few of our um, entry level roles are non-jurisdictional. In other words, you apply to be a recorder or a deputy um, district judge, not, not um, a specific you know, family judge or a family recorder, a criminal um, recorder. And then you're deployed by um, the judicial office, not by the JAC, and we run exercises that are in, um, designed to 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 test your abilities generally, not your specific knowledge. Most of the JAC exercises are not a test of knowledge. We don't set knowledge exams. Um, we 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 set competence exams or tests um, for people, and I think that does throw some candidates. They think their expert knowledge is what is going to get the, them to the role, but actually it's not. It's your ability to apply your expert knowledge in various different circumstances and situations. So I think the answer to your question is neither will get you in. It's how you use both the broad-based um, expertise and knowledge and the very deep knowledge um, that you have that will get you into the role. I mean, I'll just give you one final example. I recently did the assessments for people to be deputy high court judges where they're being approved to sit as a deputy high court judge in certain circumstances and we had people who'd got huge experience as immigration judges applying to be family court judges and we had to assess were they able to demonstrate to our satisfaction that they could um, apply themselves in a different situation um, because their immigration depth of knowledge wasn't going to be most of the time was not going to be that helpful it was how they used their expertise that we were looking for common sense and an ability to learn is really what you're you, what you're looking for the knowledge well the judicial college can teach you that but it's how you think um, and how fair and balanced and reasonable you are able to be um, and those are the skills that are needed uh, for a judge Learning, well, hopefully we can all do that. Um, and there are lots and lots of ways through the Judicial College to gain, gain the knowledge of the law. Brilliant, thank you both. Uh, very in-depth answers there. Well, I think that brings us up towards the end of the Q&A session. I wanna thank everybody that's been on the panel for their answers, um, very eye-opening and very um, in-detailed, um, the answers that we've received there. So thank you very much. Um, just before we finish, I'm going to turn to each of our panellists one by one, just for a final little soundbite, maybe a top tip um, from this evening. So I'll work um, my way across the screen from uh, left to right. So I'll start with Claire, just for a final sort of soundbite, just before we finish. Thanks, John. I think mine would be, don't be frightened. It's, we're real people. We want you to succeed. We want you to do well. It's not about tripping you up. So 
if you feel like it's something you want to do and you feel like you've got the experience, please throw your hat in the ring. Thank you. Uh, Jane, any final words for us? Um, mine would be, um, uh, as this final bit, is the character issue. Um, I've been a bit shocked by the number of applicants I've seen um, who would have been good, would have succeeded on merit, but who failed on character. Um, and uh, so my top tip would be avoid speeding, um, because if you end up with more than six points, you're not likely to be selected as good character. Uh, six points valid at the time of your application. Please pay your tax on time. If you're a self-employed barrister, pay your income tax and pay your VAT on time. Because again, we get people who've got repeated um, penalties from HMRC for not paying their tax. So keep in good odor with, uh, um, with um, HMRC. Um, and you know, avoid criminal offences generally. I mean, that sounds like quite a good piece of advice anyway, doesn't it? But, um, and if you've got something from you know, your misspent youth, um, definitely uh, declare it and explain what happened to your, the best of your ability, even if your memory is a bit faded. But um, one of my pieces of advice is guard your reputation like you do your money. So don't expose yourself um, and your reputation because it's really important when you come to apply to be a judge. It's generally important for your um, presence in public life. Uh, so guard your reputation like you would your money is what I would advise. Great advice there, Jane. We could use you at the CPS as sort of promotion. Avoid criminal offences. <laughs> 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 make me a lot less busy <laughs> yes that's right make, make john redundant <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least i will turn to anusia do we have any final words of wisdom if you want to be a judge um preparation 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 and I, I know jane said it and she said it several times and she said it for a reason um all too often we look at candidates forms and um know that they could have just done more on that form and it, it's heartbreaking we don't want to see it but we ask for examples and we want examples um, and uh, I'm afraid you just can't get through without them um, and so that's if you want to be a judge if you're going to practice at the bar or in the solicitor's profession enjoy every minute of it it's a fantastic profession to be in it's different every day you get, an, it doesn't matter what area you're in, you get an insight into people's lives that you don't normally get. And that makes me sound very nosy, doesn't it? But you also get to help people in their hour of need uh, when they're unable to help themselves. Um, and every day, as I said, every day is different. So enjoy the journey of getting to the place where you're ready to apply to become a judge. I certainly did. Um, and I, I look back at my years at the bar. I enjoy, I, I do enjoy being a judge, but I look at back at the years at the bar and the friends that I made there and the experiences that I had, and I wouldn't swap it for the world. Thank you, Anusha. Well, that brings us towards the end of the evening. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to all three of our panelists tonight. I'm sure everybody um, who's attended tonight would echo that as well. I'm sure we've all learned a lot and it's been a fantastic evening. Um, hopefully we'll try and bring you some more uh, Q&A events going forwards and in the future I'm sure that we'll work with the JAC again to bring you mm, more definitely. events. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it. I've been looking forward to this event for a long time. Um, if you want to know more, um, obviously there's the JAC website. It looks like a fantastic resource so really I would recommend using that. Um, if you want more information about what we do, it's speedmooting.com. You can uh, join the mailing list on our contact page. Uh, once again, similarly to the JAC, we don't spam you, um, but we'll certainly keep you up to date with any future events that we're running. And um, I think that uh, just brings us to an end uh, for me to say thank you one more time.